Hey, hello, and welcome to another edition of Ask Octopus, where Bob, Derek, and I will answer your questions from community and from customers that we've been talking to. So good morning, uh, Bob, and good afternoon, Derek. Morning, Ryan. Hey, Ryan. All right, let's kick this off. So my question this week is um, a variation of a question that I've been getting a lot recently, and it's uh, this is the, the one I decided to kind of pick for the to show a demo is how can I be notified every time a production deployment happens? Uh, Bob, Derek, like do y'all have any, it's, I, I know we do a lot of things like, oh, we have the email step and we have the Slack step um, and there's like community steps for like Microsoft Teams and, and other tools. Have y'all come across this specific question or? Yeah. yeah. Uh, then you go, go. Oh, I was gonna say, yeah, that happens. I think it, the email step, the, the Slack step, that, that, that works out great. Um, and most people are using that, but it's, it's not a like catch all. That's really kind of what I, that's kind of the feedback I've been getting from some of my customers. Yeah, that's exactly it. It's, it doesn't catch everything. You have to set it up on every project. Whether somebody comes through and like adds a new project, they don't set up the step. Uh, they remove the step. Uh, what happens if you switch from Slack to, uh, teams or hip chat or something and you're like oh now i gotta go update you know x dozen projects and swap all the steps out uh the solution is we can actually use subscriptions uh for that if we go subscriptions is under the configuration menu and you can see i've set up a few just like testing various uh variations of this question out uh but what's so let's go in and just look at what the ad subscription screen looks like I'm not going to name it because I'm not going to save it. Uh, but you get to filter the events that happen through Octopus. And there are some groups of events. So you can look at things like oh, auto deploy events, critical events, deployment, even down to like, hey, show me every time a machine becomes available for deployment. And if you were to select one of these, it actually will tell you which events are included in that. So machine becomes available for deployment means it was enabled it was found to be healthy or it was found to have warnings. So that means its state has changed in some way. So maybe it was unavailable and it switched to available or it was disabled, it switched to enabled. Uh, this will actually trigger a, the subscription will fire and then we'll send you either a email notification, which you can configure, select a team to send these emails to. You can say, hey, check every hour, check every day and just give me a digest of all the events that happen. Uh, and that's good, but you want something maybe a little more real time, uh, or maybe you want to perform some extra logic besides just an email. Uh, and then also email isn't a Slack notification. So you also have the option to do a webhook. So you can put in a URL and a header, and you can actually have that event be sent to a, uh, a web service that is running either on your infrastructure or maybe, uh, maybe an Azure function or a, a Lambda somewhere. And that's exactly what I've set up today. So if we actually go back to configuration, discard these changes, well, go back to subscriptions. Uh, I've got this one, so deploy to prod. So I've set up a subscription with the event filters for all deployment events, which I could actually probably filter that down, but for this one, it, like, it kind of makes sense. Anything that happens in the prod environment, I want to know about it, whether it's a deployment failed, uh, the manual intervention was raised or it was succeeded. Like all of those things I want to be notified about, but I can actually use more filters. So I can actually say only show me for the prod environment. And I could add more to that if I wanted to. I could say show me for prod and pre-prod. Uh, if you wanted to have different environments handled in different ways, you could have one for dev and one for prod. So a lot of ways to combine those. And that's pretty much the only filters I have added for it, but I have a payload URL. So you can see this is actually going to a cloud function called log prod deployment. Uh, I'm hosting that in Google Firebase. It's something I'm familiar with. It's really just a node uh, application that's running uh, through Firebase and it's hitting this function. So what's gonna happen is when that payload comes in, uh, that request with the payload comes in, I'm gonna get some token, do some authorization to make sure that just not any request is accepted on this URL. Uh, I'm taking that payload and getting the subscription name and the event message from it, and then I'm sending that to a Slack URL. 
So anytime a production deployment comes through, I'm kind of taking that payload, filtering it, manipulating it, and sending it to Slack. Uh, what a payload looks like is this. So this is what the JSON payload of that subscription will come through and, and be. So you can see that it's got like the event information, the category, so a deployment succeeded, uh, user ID of what triggered it, but then also that message that we're using, deploy to prod succeeded for OctoFX. Also HTML is available if you, if you wanna use that. And just to demo that it works, we can go in and kick off a deployment. We'll just redeploy production because uh, deploying to dev won't do anything for a demo. <laughs> That's why I've been seeing all those notifications. <laughs> I've been going to prod in the last couple of days. Oh uh, yeah, I I was hoping I wasn't blowing up your your Slack, but <laughs> no, it's <fine. laughs> I was like, yeah, it's like that seems like a good one, and it's like uh, this is a pretty simple example, like mm -hmm. of just like oh, now we have anytime a deployment happens, production, we're going to get Slack notifications. We didn't have to add the steps to every project. We don't have to worry about them accidentally being removed. If we need to update them, we update them in one place, uh, which is that function that's running. But there's a lot of other uh, ways that those webhooks can be used. One would be a uh, customer asked me like, hey, we wanna know every time a deployment process changes and we wanna make sure that you know certain things don't get removed or disabled. Uh, which makes sense. You can set up the email, and but then you're going to get an email every time the deployment process changes. And then you're kind of looking for a needle in a haystack at that point. You could set up a webhook to run and get the... Uh, sorry, Slack interrupted me because uh, it, it actually did go through. So you see these messages coming through. Uh, so yeah, so you could set up a webhook to accept the the event for whenever a deployment process changes, then you can make an API request to go and get the process and verify that it still has all the steps and the steps are in the right order or that certain things weren't removed. That's really nice. Uh, and yeah, because I, I, I was working with another customer and they have, for their particular project, they have to deploy to thousands of machines um, for various reasons, but they... <laughs> Just statistics alone, one of those machines is probably going to fail at that particular point in time. Uh, even if you're 99.999% effective, there's still one machine that's sitting out there where it failed. So what they have is they have a webhook that sits out there, and they use guided failure mode. So when the deployment occurs and, that, and a failure happens, that will trigger a webhook, and then that webhook will go find that guided failure, and it'll just tell it automatically to retry. And it, most of the time, there's some network hiccup or some, you know, random little thing and if they retry majority of the time it works just fine and so they just do that that way it kind of keeps everything going along and they don't have to sit there and babysit the entire process yeah that uh that was something else that came up i think uh there was a customer i was talking to that had a um they had a, a, a different tool they used for like approvals so like mm -hmm. approving when things go so they actually wanted when a manual approval happens in octopus for that to trigger something in the other system and you can do that with a webhook because, as we saw earlier, there's the, the event for a manual approval was raised. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can build that into your deployment process where it's like, oh, okay, I'm gonna, before I do my manual intervention step, let me send a web request to this, to this other tool. Um, but then you could actually, like using the webhook, you can build it in where it sends a, a payload to that either that tool or a webhook, a web service that knows how to also talk to that tool. I, I doubt that other, I don't remember what the name of that tool was, but I doubt it had like our payload format built into, you know, its support. Uh, but you could build that bridge between Octopus and, and other tools that you use. And then you could even have it go uh, in the opposite way where once you approve it in that other tool, it can send that request back. Cause you know, all you need to do at that point is build the API request to assign the approval and, and approve it or reject it. Mm -hmm. I really like that function, mainly just because what it does is it, it and if you can set it to notify everybody, um, and it just allows people, like even guys in support, etc., to to see when things have been deployed. 
you know, if suddenly something blows up after half an hour, just having that sort of visibility straight away, right, wait a minute, you know, there's a deployment half an hour ago, let's go and have a quick look and see exactly what's happened there. Yeah. And I, I really like how flexible it is just because it sends you enough information about that, that you can go hit the API on that webhook and start finding a bunch of different things. So even with just that event ID, and it does include the related document IDs, but with that, yep. I can I can get back to almost everything I need to get back to in the API, uh, and I can kind of figure out what's going on. Yeah, definitely. I'd say the hardest thing about using the subscription and the webhook together is not knowing. Like, I don't think we have what this structure looks like uh, documented anywhere, or I, at least I didn't find it. So maybe I'll find it after this and and be proven wrong, but. Um, what I did was actually I set up a separate, uh, so I have my function that does the Slack notification, but I set up a separate function that just accepted the events and logged them no. so that I, so I could go look at the JSON request and, and that was pretty easy to set up. So that's a, a tip for using this is as you start using it, just set up the first step would be log whatever the payload you get and then build it from there. Cool. Well, that is the end of mine, so I'm going to let uh, Derek take over. Awesome. Thank you very much, Ryan. Okay, and we should have... Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about system security. Um, what I'm going to do here is, is uh, I'll start with the core security things and over the next few weeks, I'll, I'll be doing some follow-up sessions. Uh, so today, I'm going to focus mostly on Octopus, the core uh, security uh, side of things. As you can see here, I've got a, this is just a demo instance I spun up for this. Mm -hmm. um, you can see the, the big, beautiful, not secure tab. And one of the things is, is one of the first things um, is put your uh, Octopus uh, server behind SSL. Um, that is my single biggest recommendation when it comes to um, security. This is whether it's internal or external. In this instance, uh, I, as you can see, I am mean, using a, a local URL. I do also have one on, on the same one. There is also a public URL. And one of the, the one of my one of my uh, favorite features is um, Let's Encrypt. Uh, the the, um, the configuration for Let's Encrypt. It's free, free SSL. I mean, let's be honest, guys. How often have you paid for, for, for SSL certificates? And it, sometimes it can be hundreds of dollars. Yeah, quite. I mean, quite often, to be, to be completely honest. And that's, like you said, that's the thing I loved about uh, Lex Encrypt is when they offer free SSL. It's like, why, uh, why would I ever not use it then? That's it. It's, that's it. It's, it's, to be honest, I just love you know, anything that's free and, and you know, security. It's getting the thumbs up. Um, so just to, I'm going to give you a demo of just how easy it is. Um, here, we're just going to hit the configure button. Um, the reason I'm using an internal one is I am actually, I went and purchased Derek Campbell.dev, uh, and obviously one of the, the, the issues there is it has to be over SSL. So this is the reason why I'm using an internal URL. Um, so we've got our path, we've got our HTTPS port. One thing, um, when you're validating this, you will have to have port 80 and port 443 open so that it can do the redirect as part of the validation. Mm -hmm. You put in your email address and then bind it. In this instance, I'm binding it to all IPs. And then just hit register. And then that's it, really. You just wait. Um, so um, as we're obviously, you know, as we're waiting for our SSL certificate, um, we can jump into the, uh, some of the items here. You can go here, you're responding to the HTTP challenge. It's requested a certificate. It's now configuring the server. And what's going to happen here is your server will go offline as part of that. It actually goes in, restart it, it puts it into maintenance mode, it restarts your Octopus server, and then puts it over to SSL. So we will just wait for just a moment. So is it actually also removing the uh, HTTP binding, like the port binding? It, yes, um, but what it will do is, as part of that, is it will actually force a redirect. So, with with the port eighty, um, what it's going to actually going to do is you'll see in your Octopus Server Manager that you can actually force it to go to HTTPS. Yep. Uh, so yeah, it's going to uh, configure all this for you, and then that's it. And then what we do is we have a nice little padlock certificate. 
And as you can see here, it's fully valid, octopus.derekcampbell.dev. You know, that's, oh, that's really amazing. I've never used the Let's Encrypt feature. Like, I yeah. know it's there and, and I've never set it up because like I've never been on the ops side. So like all of that was just like handled by my, my ops team before. So like they did the certificates, they did all, yeah, it was handled like there. And I was like, I, I never had to worry about it, but seeing just like go through and be, I was like, that's easy enough for me to do. Honestly, <laughs> so it makes it makes SSL, because to be honest, SSL, um, for the most part, is straightforward, but it can be a bit of a minefield. Uh, it doesn't, I mean, this is obviously if it's public facing. Um, you can use normal uh, public CAs. Um, you know, you can use that. That's no problem at all. You don't have to use, uh, but you know, you don't have to use Let's Encrypt, but let's be honest, uh, if it's free and it's secure, you know, use it if you can. You can also use uh, internal certificate authority. So if this was running on a domain and your machine's part of the domain, you can generate that and then just uh, bind it into the Octopus Server Manager. Uh, so it, not all of them are quite as slick as that, uh, but I, I really, I, I love the Let's Encrypt um, functionality. I've done this a whole bunch. It's one of the first things I do, uh, particularly if it's public facing. Oh yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, as you can see, that's it there. It's really secure. It's the biggest, it is the biggest, it's the biggest recommended um, change that I would put forward for any. If you want to, you know, if your compliance team or your security team is, is wanting to make Octopus um, secure, then that is, you know, number one. Um, the next one is actually upgrading as well. Um, we, you know, it's absolutely key that you're upgrading, um, mainly because we are often, you know, Things do pop up, um, you know, obviously common vulnerabilities do pop up occasionally, uh, and we do address those as part of the patching. Um, and workers, um, so the benefit of workers um, is, I don't want to go into too much what workers is, but the benefits of workers is you can actually have a, an external worker, um, and the benefit of that is you could technically have someone in your team, and I'm not saying, you know, obviously at the end of the day, um, obviously I'm sure people are responsible, but you could have someone in your team who wants to do malicious stuff to your Octopus environment. And having that in place, having that actually away from your Octopus server will safeguard that. Um, you, you do have the option for a built-in worker. There are security um, issues there. You can run it as a different user or you can run it as the, the the same user as Octopus, but that generally is an administrator account and generally frowned upon. Uh, so you know your your security team will get you know wipe their fingers at you. Um, and apart from that, really, there's just some general um, some general you know hardening the OS, uh, rename your administra administrator account, um, configure malware, uh, prevent user provided scripts uh, from doing harm. That's your you know workers, um, and also. Configure your firewall. I, I have been guilty of the past of just disabling the firewall, um, generally because it's a little bit easier. But you know that's good when if it's an internal server. But generally, yeah, just configure your your uh, firewall. Harden SQL. Um, there's not really, you know, there's just some common sense around that. If you're ever unsure about it, just um, talk to a DBA. But generally, I stay away from DB uh, admin so that obviously, you know, wherever possible, you you can't break it too much. Um, and what, one of the ones that I've actually found um, is within the project, obviously this is just an example, but generally within your, your project variables, is make sure that your sensitive variables are actually marked as sensitive. Um, quite often, you know, guys, you ask customers for their database, um, and sometimes I, I, I get into an issue and passwords are stored in, in clear text. Um, that is one of my biggest recommendations. It's something I see more often than I care to admit, and it's you can go and you can see full connection strings, whereas a sensitive variable, you shouldn't ever be able to pull that back out of Octopus. Hey, well, show, yes. us, show us that real quick. Show us how to make sure that it's set as yeah. a yeah. sensitive variable. Test, and then what I do here is Just put your password in, yeah. Yeah, and then that's it. So really, obviously, you make sure that you select sensitive first, and then, you know, you use your super secret password one, two, three, four. Um, <laughs> and then that's it. And then you press enter. And that's you. You've got it now. It's there. Um, you've got your security. As you can see, you can actually get it back, but you can change it. So it's, it's, it's basically, it's right only, you can write through the UI, but it will be used as part of the deployment process, obviously. It'll be decrypted. Yeah. 
yeah, that's stored, obviously. That's encrypted using your master key, um, mm. all that sort of good stuff. Um, and if you ever do supply a database to Octopus, anything like us, we can't actually decrypt it. It will just purge it from the database. Yeah. And that uh, if it is printed out in the logs, it will be masked in the logs. So it's another point there is to not have a password that is something common that would show up as because like it's the masking just looks for anything that matches. So if your password was, you know, uh, deploy or verbose or info, it would be masking a whole bunch of logs. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually a good point. That is a good point. Actually, one last thing, um, just make sure, talk to your networking team um, and make sure that wherever possible, uh, look at your networking. And we do have a whole um, a page which goes into the inbound drills and the outbound drills and what each one does uh, each one does so from there you can always check um, and you, you know you may find that not all of these are applicable to you um, you know obviously for instance you may not want RDP uh, you could be running uh, server core and you want the remote management and that brings a different issue altogether as well but yeah um, that's it for security system security my other thing I, I could think of off the top of my head you mentioned master key was Make sure you have a copy of that master key stored in some place like in LastPass or some sort of password manager, but not just have it on the Octopus server. Because if you do lose that, you're going to have a really bad day uh, if you have a bunch of sensitive variables. Yeah. That is that, yes. Yeah, don't yeah. just save it on the C drive and call yeah. it done. <laughs> no, do you know, do you know what, the, what I've done in the past accidentally is actually saved it. Make sure you save it locally because uh, what I've done in the past is actually saved it after I've snapshotted a virtual machine and mm. then it's not went to plan. I went to roll it back and then suddenly the master key was gone as well. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, just be careful. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that, yeah. so just a, a little bit of clarification. The master key, that's what you used to, like Derek said, to encrypt and decrypt it. So if you were to ever have to, like if you lost your server, like your server crashed for whatever reason and all you had was a database backup, when you wanted to rebuild your server, if you didn't have that master key, when you try to point to the database, it's going to go, I don't have a master key and I can't decrypt all this. And so then we have to go through a, there's a command line utility that said, I lost my master key. So you'll still get all your configuration and everything, but you won't get, your sensitive variables and you won't get the certificate. So all your tentacles will not trust the new server because the certificate and the thumbprint will be completely different. So like when we say it'll be a bad day, it'll be a, it'll be a pretty bad day. Yeah, back it up and then back it up again and then just again, back it up <laughs> again. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, I'm gonna take over. So this was a question that I get and we kind of get this fairly often or some sort of variation of this question. Um, how do I redeploy a previously successful release when the current one fails? Uh, another version of that question is how do you do rollbacks? Uh, I'm sure you guys have gotten that question quite a bit. All of the time. All, all the time. <laughs> all the time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the rollbacks are a fun question to answer. Yeah. Roll forward, guys. Roll forward. <laughs> Always roll forward. So, yeah. The thought that I had, so that the, the, when the customer contacted me and they asked this particular question, uh, my first response was, what about the database? Uh, because that's the most, that's the critical point of your rollback or your roll forward. Because if even if you take a snapshot and let's say you took a snapshot at the beginning of your deployment and then you did your, did all your database changes, then you deployed your code. Well, because you did those database changes and then you deployed your code, it's not really a good way to roll that back. You could restore your snapshot and that'd be fine. But if anyone had gone in and made any changes to the data or if your migration scripts moved data around or did anything like that, then you're gonna have a lot of, a lot of issues. And he goes, and this particular customer goes, no, we've got it so our database changes are deployed ahead of time and they're back, always backwards compatible. Mm -hmm. So really they're worried about just the code. Uh, and in fact, they were deploying to, I think it was just a, an IIS deployment and how they were doing it is they would just deploy to a, a new folder in this change IIS, like where it would IIS uh, application was pointing to. So I was like, oh, well, if you're just dealing with code, yeah, there's then yeah, we could start talking about automatic rollbacks or previous uh, automatically doing all this stuff. Yeah, that's a good situation to be in where your database changes are backwards compatible and can go out in advance. That's how, yeah. How often does that actually happen? <laughs> Uh, I think it takes a, a bit of a dis it, it takes a bit of discipline uh, to to do that. 
I, it is completely possible, but you have to be very disciplined with your changes that you want to make. So I'm going to walk you through the process that I kind of put together. And there's, so there's a couple things that I wanted to bring up. Uh, so by default, actually, if you go to our system, if you go to our documentation and find system variables, uh, there is a system variable called octopus.deployment.previoussuccessful.id. And this will do the ID of the previous successful deployment of this project in the target environment. However, that is channel agnostic. And so what I mean by that is if I were to do a deployment to the default channel and it were to fail, it would find this release because this was the most recent release that had gone to development. And depending on your needs, that's, that could be great. That's exactly what you want to do. Um, in other cases, you might be using channels for other reasons. Maybe you're using channels for feature branch deployment or maybe you're using it for a uh, hotfix and you don't want to have that exact same, that, that previous release go out you, or yeah, that previous release be deployed. So that gets things a little bit trickier because what we really want to do is we want to find this release because that's the one for that particular channel. So I put together a couple of PowerShell scripts in hindsight being what it is after seeing Ryan's presentation, you could probably do all this. You could send the failure notification and do this through a subscription. That would probably be a lot better. So you wouldn't have to add this to every single one of your projects, but for demonstration purposes, I think it, will, it works just fine. So if you just want to use the variable, the previous successful variable, it's not super hard. You would just use the variable and then I would need to find just a little bit of information about that previous deployment. So I just query the API Hit the release, get the release ID, and then I just build out my uh, my request, and then I just send it over. I could probably use octo.exe, but again, I just wanted to use the API since I already had to do it here. It's like, oh, this might as well just reuse that. So if you're using the previous successful deployment ID, it's pretty simple. If you're using, if you want to do it where you're deploying it by the channel and you want to get that all working, it gets a little bit more complex. And I'll have links to uh, these scripts in our in the, in the description below. Uh, but what you have to do is you have to hit the progression endpoint for that particular project, because that's the endpoint that's used in the overview screen to generate the, uh, the dashboard, basically. So then what you have to do is you have to kind of go through and loop through that, and you have to basically have a little bit more logic inside here. So I have a bit of logic in here that said, if this is the current deployment, go ahead and skip it. If the last deployment, if it's not success, go ahead and skip it. If it's not for the channel ID, go ahead and skip it. Then if everything matches up, then actually do that deployment. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna create a release and I, you can watch this all happen in action. And I, I know this will fail uh, because in my deployment process, there is a step that says verify deployment. And I have a script in there and I. I purposely make it fail for very specific reasons. So we can we can watch this happen and shouldn't take too long to do the deployment. Yep, there it goes, kicked it off. Set up, oh, we had a failure. So if we come back here and within a couple seconds, I see an email notification just came through on my screen. You guys can't see it because it's on a different thing, but now we see 1.3 got picked up and is automatically redeploying that. And that one should be successful because we knew it was successful before. You would hope so. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lovely setup, Bob. I would really like that. Yeah, and in the future, I think using a subscription probably would make actually a little bit of sense to so you could have this, but maybe in the subscription you would filter on specific project types or in the webhook itself, it would know, oh, this is if this is a database project you know, stop it, don't, don't try to redeploy it. Or if this is a, uh, if it's like a web UI project or a Windows service project, you could probably have a little bit of business logic in that, in that web hook that made that determination of whether or not this is, this could be qualified as a redeployment. Yeah, that's the nice thing about the, the web hook. It really, you get a lot more ability to build your own logic in. So it doesn't necessarily have to be things that you can just pull from our API. You could have your own database that says like, I'm just going to store off the projects that I care about in this table and then check it from there. Or you could even hard code it into the function, but usually you probably want to store it in a, a data set somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking also you could name me naming convention as well. Naming so. convention. Yeah. 
yeah, uh, so that's a, a nice easy way to handle handle rollbacks. But again, uh, the database piece is key. If you're deploying your database with your code, then it's going to make things a lot harder to do an automatic rollback. And you'll really have to kind of work through those, those various processes. Uh, that's why I typically we recommend, if you look at what I have set up, having the web UI and the database be separate projects and then use our what we call a traffic cop project to handle doing the deploy release step. So it handles deploying those releases in that particular way. Um, Where did you find that icon? That looks like an angry traffic cop. <laughs> I found it so <laughs> Google images. <laughs> I just typed in the Google traffic cop icon or traffic icon. Or no, I guess, icon. yeah, I guess it's like sunglasses, but it just makes him look angry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was looking for black and white icons for everything. Yeah. Doing this, but yeah. So that's, that would be a recommendation. Like, yeah, if you if you have have the head of the database project completely separate and have all your database projects, because then you'll know, okay, I need to do a backup. I need to maybe do a restore. I maybe just need to roll forward with these changes or whatever number of different things. Or you could have your database project go out a week in advance or a couple of days in advance, um, and then you deploy your web UI. So. All right, thank you very much, everybody, for joining us today. Uh, if you have an interesting question you'd like us to answer for you, uh, please submit it at hello.octopus.com slash askoctopus or email us. Uh, in addition, join us on our community Slack channel and we'll do our best to answer any questions there. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Ryan and Derek, for joining us today. Yeah, I'll talk to you later. Cheerio.